Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Welcome back to Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset Healthcare Post-COVID-19, which is held in collaboration with Friends Health Connection. Now that the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic has passed, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset resumed its outpatient and surgical services. As we welcome you back, we have taken the appropriate precautions to ensure your safety. During today's webinar, we will learn more about Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset's reopening of services and safety precautions from Tony Kava, the president and CEO. We will begin with 20 minutes of a moderated discussion, and then we will open it up to questions and answers from our audience. Thank you for joining us today, Tony. Good morning, Serena. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So let's start with an overview of what services have resumed at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset. Could you please share that with our audience? Sure. So we're really excited about it. Uh, we're into our third week of uh, our reopening, if you will, or unwinding as we're calling it, for all of our outpatient services. So we started, uh, as I said, about three weeks ago and gradually opened up uh, our services both here on our campus and in our, our sites uh, off campus. Uh, this week, on Tuesday, we are excited to begin our elective surgery, and we've seen a, a very uh, good ramp up of, of that as well. So we're hoping within the next couple of weeks, as we gradually unwind and, and get back to our new normal, that we'll, all of our services, inpatient, outpatient, invasive, and non-invasive, will all be open up uh, for our community. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. So I know we've done a lot, but can you tell everybody what precautions we have put in place to ensure patient safety? Like yeah, such we, as, you know, the, the screening as you come in the entrance, things like that. Sure. So we've made safety our top priority uh, throughout this pandemic, uh, both for our staff and obviously for the community. So some of the things that we've done and we've been doing for the last eight or nine weeks is as you enter the hospital, you will, you will have your temperature checked. You will also be asked three or four uh, pertinent questions that will allow us to assure that you're screened appropriately. Um, we also uh, will give you a mask upon entry, uh, yourself and anyone with you, and all of our staff will be wearing masks. And the purpose of that is to protect ourselves from each other. Uh, the, the masking of the nose and the mouth really prevents the spread of COVID-19. Uh, and additionally, we'll make sure that if you come in for a service, and you're in a waiting area, you're appropriately distanced. So your neighbor, if you will, will be six feet or more away from you. And if we don't have capacity within the area where we provide the service, we'll have you wait in our lobby, again, appropriately distanced, and then we'll call you in for your procedure. We've also staggered our procedure times. Uh, we have, uh, is typically you would do a procedure every 10 or 15 minutes. Now we've extended those to 30 minutes, again, to assure your safety. Uh, but in addition, we've taken a lot of precautions in terms of uh, doing what we call a terminal clean or disinfecting our hospital. Every time we uh, close uh, a COVID unit, we would close it down for three to four days and terminally clean the entire unit. We, we assure the, that we've gotten every little bit of the, of the virus, if you will. We change all the patient curtains, uh, and then we reopen that unit and freshly clean it. In addition, our environmental services staff, who's been terrific throughout this pandemic, will go around the hospital two to three times a day and clean the elevator buttons, the uh, railings, uh, the, the stairwells, anywhere where the public or our staff would go, again, to assure that we're, we're uh, keeping the organization uh, pristine and safe for everyone to come in. That's great, that's a lot. So I know, you know we've gotten a lot of questions from the community about the ED. We've seen our volumes go down, and I think it's really important for our audience to know like what safety measures we've actually taken in the emergency department. Would you kindly share that with them? Sure. So our emergency department obviously is the main portal of entry for many of our patients, and uh, we're, we're happy to say that many of the measures that we put in place throughout the rest of the hospital are also in place in the emergency department. I think in addition, we've gone above and beyond in that when you, when you do present, you will also be asked to put a mask on and all of our caregivers will be wearing the appropriate masking and PPE to protect you from them and, and, uh, uh, and them from us. Uh, again, that's extremely important. And if you have any influenza-like illness, an ILI, you'll be put into a separate private area, <clears throat> 
excuse me, that allows us to do uh, appropriate testing to rule out COVID or any other viruses. So we've really stepped up our ability to, uh, to assure that you are safe when you come in our emergency room. And we want you to know that whether, uh, whatever your, your situation is, please, please feel free to come in and feel safe. Uh, in fact, I feel very safe walking our emergency room and, and our entire hospital, and you should feel the same way when you come in. We, we are here for you. Great, thank you. That was a really great explanation. Now, when COVID-19 first hit, you know, many of the hospitals across the state, including ours, you know, put some restrictions on visitors, um, you know, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So are there still restrictions on visitors today? Yeah, great question. So yes, we, we still have visitor restrictions. And as many of you may know, um, the governor, Governor Murphy, has been really, uh, really on top of this as well. And he the state under, under his executive order has also put in very uh, stringent visitor restrictions. And we actually abide by those. Um, we, we do have a little bit of latitude in that, obviously if you're coming in to have a baby and you want your, your partner with you, that of course is allowed. Again, both of you will be screened and masked and then your partner will stay in your room with you uh, during the birthing experience. Uh, we also will allow, if you have, if you're under the care of someone, so for example, if you, if you have a dependent child or someone with dementia who you are the primary caregiver, we will allow you to come into the hospital as well. Again, you'll be appropriately screened and masked and you'll be asked to stay in the room with the patient while they're here during their hospitalization. And we also have gone a little, a little further in that we know this is a really difficult time for the community and, and you can't see your loved ones. Uh, we, do, we do provide FaceTime for anyone who wants to FaceTime with their loved one. Our nurses have been absolutely terrific being the conduit between the patient and their loved ones. Um, but we've also just extended that a little bit in that in an unfortunate situation where it's, where it's end of life, we will allow one uh, family member to come in and be able to see their loved one uh, in those particular situations. So we are trying to be sensitive and, and I know it's a very, very tough time for everyone. I put myself in the place of of family members and I know how I would feel. But it's absolutely necessary that we, we continue to keep visitor restrictions in place. Again, it's for your protection, it's for the protection of our staff, and it enables us to continue to provide the, the, the best, safest, and highest quality care for, for our patients in our community. Thank you. So um, before you mentioned uh, you were talking about cleaning and deep cleaning, so can you tell us about how you keep, how we keep the hospital clean? Like, can you expand upon that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, again, our environmental services team is absolutely terrific. Um, very early on during the pandemic and continuing through now, um, the cleaning process has been taken to a next level. Again, we call it terminal cleaning. It's cleaning to the level of if each of our rooms were an operating room. So after an operating room procedure, our environmental services team goes in and does the highest level of disinfection possible. We've now taken that process and have expanded it throughout the entire hospital. So as we close a unit, we will do that high level disinfection where we will spray everything down, we will wash everything down, and again, change the curtains appropriately. Uh, and, and then daily, uh, again, several times a day, we, we do spray those high public, high traffic areas to assure that we're, we're providing the safest, cleanest environment. I hope that answers your question, Serena. <laughs> well, you know, answers mine, but you know, we you never know. We could have some questions specifically from our audience regarding that. Of so course. thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, again, with COVID, you know, a lot of providers, including the hospital, we've had to switch to kind of telemedicine or telehealth. Um, so, how is our hospital using telehealth services? You know, specifically to what departments and how is it being used today? Sure. So telemedicine is obviously the, the uh, way of the future to a large degree, but we've had to accelerate that process. But, but everyone needs to know that we've used telemedicine here for quite a long time. We've used it in our neurology service. We've used it in our pediatric service. Uh, we also used it in, in our behavioral health service. With this pandemic, we've now stepped that up. Most of our outpatient behavioral health visits are now done by, by telehealth or telemedicine. Um, which we will continue as we go through this because it's been very successful. We've also started to use it in, in our rehab facilities. 
Now, obviously, through telemedicine, you, you're not going to have the uh, hands-on experience, but a lot of the screenings and a lot of the assessments can be done through telemedicine uh, in our rehab area. We've also used it uh, in our emergency department where appropriate. Uh, we've also used it and really have stepped it up in our proud family health center. A lot of the, uh, the visits can be done virtually. They don't have to be face-to-face uh, -face in a room. Uh, and also our family practice, where a lot of our telehealth uh, visits, again, you don't need to have the hands-on. Uh, but we've also expanded it into our physician office practices. Our uh, medical group has been absolutely phenomenal. In fact, during the month of April, more telehealth visits were done uh, this year in April than all of last year in 2019. And most of our offices and most of our services will continue telemedicine even as we unwind through this pandemic. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's a really nice service. In fact, we did a, a webinar recently on the whole telemedicine services. So um, is the hospital preparing for a possible resurgence of COVID? Uh, unfortunately, yes, we are. Uh, I, I think that's the prudent thing to do. I, I think that we've had a lot of lessons learned from this first surge uh, with the pandemic in terms of things that we need to change and, and put in place. But we're listening to the public health experts. Um, there is some controversy, controversy as to whether we will have a second surge in the fall at, as there's a confluence with the flu and, and what that is going to do in terms of, uh, of uh, a resurgence. But we, we have been preparing actually for the last several weeks. We've uh, created our own strategic stockpile of uh, PPE equipment, of sanitizers, of, of ventilators. Uh, we've also added some changes to the physical structure within our hospital. Again, lessons learned from the first time around. And I think that's really benefited us. So we'll be prepared for a second surge of COVID or we'll be prepared for any other uh, vir viral outbreak in the future. And I, and I think this was a, a warning shot for all of us that we really need to, to sit up and take notice. Definitely. So thank you. So, you know, you've been talking about what we're doing as a hospital, but what can the community do to help to prevent the spread of, of the virus? Yeah, again, that's a great question. You know, we can't do this alone. The only way for us to flatten that curve and keep it flattened is if we have a partnership with the community. And you've heard the governor and you've heard uh, many of the public health experts say that we should do the following. When you're out in public, wear a mask, wear a face covering. Um, and that needs to continue. In, in my personal opinion, I think that needs to continue until we have a vaccine. Uh, we also need to physical or social distance. Again, six feet or more away from the person nearest you. I think that's extremely important. Thirdly, hand sanitization. Bring hand sanitizer with you wherever you go. Wash your hands frequently uh, whenever you touch something. If you're out in a food store before you, before you come back home, sanitize your hands. Don't touch your, your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And lastly, if you don't feel well, don't go out into a public area. Call your physician, do telemedicine, and they'll be able to advise you of the appropriate next steps. But if those four steps are taken and we continue to follow those, we hopefully will not see a resurgence and we'll be able to, to beat this virus because, again, until we have a vaccine, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to keep this virus away. So what are the experts saying in terms of when that vaccine will, will be available? How far out do you, do you anticipate or do they anticipate? So development of a vaccine, uh, as I'm sure you've heard, could take upwards of five years in some cases. Uh, vaccines in, in past uh, epidemics have been developed quicker. So We've heard anywhere from right after the new year, which means January of 2021, till sometime in June or July of 2021. So I would expect for the next six to 12 months, uh, we will need to continue doing what I just articulated. But hopefully some point within that time, a year from now, maybe we will have a vaccine. If uh, development is quicker than, than maybe sooner than that. Um, but again, we don't know when, if it's developed, when it's going to be available for public consumption. And really what we don't also know is what the effectiveness of that vaccine is going to be like. Thank you. Okay. So um, what I would like to do now, we actually um, kind of reached that point of our webinar where we want to open it up to questions from our audience. So for our audience, if you have any questions, you could post them in the chat feature, and then I will share them with Tony. 
So we do have um, one of our questions here is, um, okay, so what is the best way that the public can thank and support the hospital and healthcare professionals? Hmm. Well, we've received just tremendous support from the community. Uh, we've probably had over $300,000 worth of food donated to the hospital over these past uh, three months or so. Um, the support of cards and letters, uh, the outpouring of affection through uh, things like uh, a car caravan, with, which the uh, Somerville Elks did early on in this pandemic. So, you know, I, I think the best way is to recognize that the healthcare workers do what they do every single day, regardless of whether COVID is here or not, that the healthcare team has a really difficult job and they do tremendous work every single day. So I think just keeping that in mind, that the recognition of what our team does every single day is so important to the livelihood of our community, um, that that feeling, that, that feeling of recognizing healthcare workers as heroes shouldn't go away when the COVID pandemic uh, goes away. It should stay all the time. Again, because the team does give of its own personal time, its own personal safety to assure that everyone who comes into our hospital gets the highest quality of care. Okay. Um, we have another question. This is a very good question. What type of mask is best to wear? Do you recommend a higher end mask with the, with the filter or do you, um, the regular light blue or the, I guess the surgical masks um, and white earlobe masks work well too? So I guess, what, what would you recommend for our audience? So for the community, uh, if you're out just amongst yourselves, really uh, uh, any face covering will do for the most part, a scarf or any one of the handmade masks. Um, or if you have a, a, the ability to have a surgical mask, a surgical mask is fine. You do not need an N95 mask, which is the highest level. It's very tightly fitted. Um, that our healthcare workers, our frontline healthcare workers wear. You do not need that in the public. That's, that's a bit of an overkill. Again, you need, when you're wearing a face covering, you need to make sure that your mouth and your nose are covered at all times. Um, and if you're in a concentrated area with a lot of people and you're a little too close, you can't social distance, you may want to think of some kind of eye protection as well. You know, clear goggles, or if you wear glasses, put your glasses on but there's nothing really special. And if you're wearing a cloth mask, my advice would be to take that mask off every day and, and launder it and, and make sure it you know, dries out appropriately and wear it again. If you're wearing a, a typical surgical mask, depending on how often you use it, you may be able to use it for a day or two, but if it gets soiled with a lot of makeup, you'd wanna throw that away and, and, and get a new one. That's this one. Yes, that's this that's one. a plain surgical mask. Yep. That's what we use, yep. And then, of course, if they're wearing eye goggles, they should clean those pretty regularly too, correct? Absolutely, yeah. You might want to also just remember to clean your, you know, as you're sanitizing your hands, sanitize your phones, uh, because remember, you're touching your phone every day. You're putting it to your ear, to your mouth, your hands, all those places of contact where the virus could be transmitted. So you might want to make sure that you also sanitize your phones. Sure, and, and maybe keys, everything they touch, right? Yes. I would assume, okay. Um, so here's another question. As for wiping down the patient's room, do they regularly wipe down the things like remote control buttons for the TVs, light switches, et cetera? Yes, everything. As I said, that terminal cleaning is a very deep cleaning. So when a patient leaves the room, literally everything is taken out of the room and everything is sanitized. And, and we use a, a, a special uh, solution to do that that pretty much kills everything, viruses, bacteria, uh, spores, anything that could possibly exist on a hard surface. So yeah, we wipe down all of the call buttons, all of the, the trays, chairs, obviously the, the beds, uh, the mattresses are all terminally clean, uh, the curtains are changed, so we do that on a regular basis. Okay. Um, so uh, our next question is, if you could, please explain how protecting staff and patients um, and um, has prevented an internal spread of COVID? Huh. Well, that's a great question. So um, again, as I said, very early on within the pandemic, we started to mask our staff. We started to do the screenings upon entry. So we took, 
those of you who know our hospital, we, we've taken it, we boiled it down to one entryway into the hospital, one entryway into our cancer center. And we started the temperature screenings and asking the questions and masking. I firmly believe that masking our staff and masking every patient that comes in, came into our hospital prevented the spread, uh, the potential spread of the virus uh, from one person to another. Uh, we we have very little outbreaks, actually hardly any. We didn't have any outbreaks within our facility. We had small small clusters of our staff uh, who got COVID and most of them got COVID outside of our hospital. But here's the other thing that we did. We isolated our COVID patients on separate units from the very beginning. So we never co-mingled patients who were non-COVID and COVID. We put all of our COVID patients on, on separate units. We had all those units locked down. We had all the doors closed. We had separate teams taking care of those patients. And of course, most importantly, we provided the highest level of PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, for all of our staff to assure that, that it, the disease wasn't spread. And we were very, very successful. Yeah, definitely. Other, other sections of our industry, not so lucky. And maybe I think due to a PPE shortage, correct? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, with the pandemic hitting so quickly and, and us not having a, uh, a good strategic stockpile from a federal level perspective, uh, we, some places were really caught short. As many of you know, the fact that many of the gowns and masks and such are made in China, uh, and they were going through their own struggles with, uh, with COVID-19. So it, it, it became very difficult uh, to, to get PPE around the country, not, not only locally. But we were fortunate with the help of our, our healthcare system um, and the reach of that healthcare system and plus our own local preparation, uh, we were never without, never without the appropriate protective uh, equipment for our staff. And, and I was very confident that we kept our staff uh, 100% safe. So this one is, uh, I think the next um, is kind of a comment question. Um, so um, some, some of our community may know or may not know that some of our healthcare workers have actually been staying in hotel rooms over the last several months so that they can prevent the spread in their own families and protect their families. So this is a comment that, you know, community or folks can still help healthcare workers staying in hotels with care packages. And there is a post of where they can go to do that. So I think that that's a comment off of that question of how we can thank our healthcare providers. That's great. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, out of curiosity, what percentage of our healthcare workers were actually staying in hotels? Uh, I don't think it was a very large percentage. I, I think at the highest, it was probably 45 or so uh, individuals who were staying in hotels. And again, we were paying the cost of the hotel for them since they were away from their families. And we were also providing them with meals as well during their hotel stays. Uh, but it varied. Some, some stayed a couple of weeks, some stayed uh, a month or two, but it wasn't a large number. Wow. Okay. Um, so going back, uh, this is a question going back to masking. How can a mask be worn and still allow for the ability to breathe? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, please you the, can. Yeah, yeah right? the masks. The masks are very breathable, so you don't have to worry about not being able to breathe. I mean, if you're going to run a marathon, it might be a little bit difficult, uh, but otherwise, uh, no. The masks. The masks are very breathable, and many of the uh, handmade cloth masks. I know some of them are becoming designer items at this point. Uh, are also very breathable, so there's there's really no worry about breathing and wearing the mask. We, we wear, as Serena pointed out, we wear them all day when we're in the hospital, whenever we leave our offices, and uh, we're all fine. Yeah. So like right now, you and I are social, appropriately socially distanced. We're in an office by ourselves, which is why we, nor we aren't wearing them. But normally, um, when we have, we're around people, um, you will see us like this. Yes, right. yeah, exactly. When we're in our offices uh, by ourselves, it's appropriate to, to take the mask off, but as soon as we leave our offices, we will, we will all, as, as Serena pointed out, wear our masks. So um, who, um, who you treat COVID patients, uh, oh, I think this is what do you treat COVID patients with? Um, Rendisivir with a Z-Pak or the hydrochloroquine with a Z-Pak? Did I get that right? The hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Oh, see, see, I'm not a pharmacist, Tony. You know I'm going to butcher that one up. <laughs> yeah. 
so early, so let me state this very carefully. Early on in the pandemic, none of us had dealt with any anything like this before. So it was very difficult. We were kind of learning as we went along. Quite honestly, there was not a, a written playbook. Uh, early on, we did use hydroxychloroquine and we did use hydroxychloroquine with uh, a ZPAV or azithromycin. Um, and we found to some degree that there was moderate effectiveness. Uh, as the pandemic continued to evolve and more and more studies were coming out, it was proven unequivocally um, that hydroxychloroquine was not that effective and in fact was toxic in many people. So we stopped using hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin in our patients. Um, we did use remdesivir. We were fortunate enough that we were the principal investigating hospital uh, for the remdesivir study before it was released under emergency uh, uh, compassionate use. So we, I believe at this point in time, we probably have over 70 patients who have been on remdesivir, uh, which proved to be very successful. In the initial study, it was five days. Now it's 10 days of remdesivir um, that's given earlier in the course of the disease rather than later. But in, it, remdesivir is not a cure-all. Um, it reduces the symptomatology and the severity of the illness. Uh, but additionally, there are many other medications uh, that patients were on. And some of our patients who are in our critical care unit uh, had upwards of 10 to 12 different medications being used simultaneously. So there is a wide uh, array of different medications that were used to, to help these patients. So there isn't a magic bullet or a silver bullet. There isn't a cure medication. That's still being uh, you know, studied, if you will. At some point, I believe there will be an antiviral agent that's specific to COVID, just like there are antiviral agents that are specific to the flu. Wow. Um, our, one of our last questions, um, more related to, I guess, um, health within the community. As businesses, especially small businesses, open, what are some things that people should be mindful about? You know, uh, from cafes, is it better to sit inside, outside? Um, any tips as we start leaving our homes a bit more? Well, obviously, uh, open air is better than being in a confined space. And I think many of our, our food businesses, many of our restaurants will be providing more open space uh, dining than inside. I think once the governor opens up, I think he's going to allow a first 25% capacity. So just like we've said earlier, whenever you're in that environment, you should have a mask on. Obviously, if you're going to be eating, you can take it off to eat. Um, but you, you should also, you know, you should especially have a mask on when you're out. You should, again, bring your hand sanitizer so that when you're done eating, so you, again, you don't touch your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, use your hand sanitizer, um, and, and, you know, you should be fine. But it, it's common sense. So when you're in these restaurants, whether it's outside or inside, I, I know they will have you appropriately social distance, six feet apart. Um, obviously, if you're with your family and your family's been, been self-quarantined, you should be fine. Uh, but if you follow those simple steps, you know, it should be fine. You don't want to be in large crowds in a contained area with no masks. That's bad. So what are um, final thoughts about what do you want the community to know about coming back to RWJ Somerset? Well, I, I think it's simple, Serena. It's we are safe. I've been here in the hospital for nine weeks from the very start. I was here 12, 16 hours a day. I, I, I uh, rounded on every single one of our COVID floors, uh, and I am virus-free. I had an antibody test, so I can say that with certainty. I know I am virus-free. Uh, we, are, we are very safe. We've been very safe throughout the entire pandemic, and we will assure the, the safety of, our, of the public. I have no doubt, I, I have no doubt in my mind that I wouldn't say this if I wasn't sure, that it is safer being in a hospital than it is being outside shopping in a confined area because I know exactly what we've done here to control the environment. And, and I am unequivocally uh, sure that we are the safest place to be. So we, we're here to serve you. We wanna make sure that you know uh, if you have chest pain, if, if you think, you know, you have some kind of problem that you need us for, please come back. We are here and you will be safe. We will protect you. I want to mention one other thing. With part of the elective surgeries, we are, are testing all of our patients 
24, uh, 48 to 72 hours before elective surgery. So they will come in as part of their pre-admission testing um, and they will have a COVID test. We'll ask them to go home and shelter in place and we will assure that they are, are safe to come back in and have their surgery. We also are doing uh, testing on all uh, patients coming in for uh, deliveries of, of babies and, and their partners. And we're also testing for anyone coming in for any other invasive procedure. So we wanna make sure that again, the environment is absolutely safe for you to have your procedure and also to protect our staffs. So we are testing those, those patients as they're coming into our hospital. Very good. Well, thank you. I think if there are no other questions, then um, this will actually conclude our webinar for today. We wanna to thank, thank you, Tony. Thank you all for joining us. Sure. Um, please remember that the opinions uh, shared here today are not a substitute for um, medical advice from a physician. If you need a physician, please call 1-888 724-7123. Um, for more information about Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset, please log on to our website at www.rwjbh.org backslash Somerset. On behalf of Tony and Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks, Serena.